Good afternoon. My name is Jim Lewis. Welcome to CSIS. Um, we're really happy to have this event. We'd like to thank FireEye for helping to sponsor it. This is the fourth time we've scheduled it. Every time we've scheduled it, something has happened. Usually it's been either a snowfall or we had one on February Friday the 13th. That didn't work. And today is important because we were doing this, remember, for the executive order on information sharing. These guys have to slow down. I can't keep up with them. So we'll probably talk about some other executive order as well today. But the format is we will have uh, Michael Daniel from the NSC give some opening remarks, talk about what they're thinking about. Um, we'll then have time for a few, probably two or three max questions with Michael. We'll then go to a panel, uh, which my uh, cohort in crime, Denise Zhang, will, uh, will moderate. And then we'll close up with remarks from David Granis from SSCI on the status of legislation and where we are on the Hill. So it's a pretty full schedule. Thank you very much for coming out with that. Um, we have bio, bios uh, on the web for people who don't know who Michael Daniel is, uh, but let me turn it over to him. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, finally be here, and they decided to finally move it to late enough in the uh, calendar that it's actually a good weather day uh, outside, although it is April Fool's Day. Um, so there's something sort of ironic in that. Um, so I would also, I, I do want to recognize uh, CSIS's uh, strong record of leadership in helping uh, us shape and promote really good uh, cybersecurity policy in the United States and informing the public about cybersecurity and technology issues. So thank you, Jim, for all that you, uh, that you do in that space. Um, so as Jim said, uh, I'm Michael Daniel, and I'm the uh, Special Assistant to the President and Cybersecurity Coordinator at the White House. Um, so in, that, in my job there, I lead the federal government's development of national cybersecurity strategy and policy and oversee the implementation of those policies. Uh, so in layman's terms, that makes me the chief cat herder for uh, cybersecurity in the federal government. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that we've spent a lot of time on uh, recently, uh, information sharing and sort of what the administration is doing in that uh, area. Obviously, information sharing, um, you know, get this room full of people, and, you know, if there's 100 people in this room, I could bring up information sharing, and we'd easily have 150 uh, definitions of what information sharing actually means. Um, but for us, I think that uh, we view information sharing in the cybersecurity space as a very foundational uh, element of our ability to combat uh, the cyber threat. Um, it is certainly not uh, the end-all and be-all of what we need to do um, because certainly uh, actually just the act of sharing information doesn't in fact make anybody better off unless you do something with the information uh, on the other end. Uh, if the government isn't doing something with the information we get uh, from the private sector or that the private sector is not doing something with the information they get from the government. Um, but in order to enable that action, in order to enable intelligent uh, and well-informed uh, action, you need to have that information sharing going on. Uh, and so that is why, as a focal point, uh, we have had many different efforts uh, in several areas to promote uh, the greater flow of information uh, both within the government, uh, between the various parts of the federal government, uh, between the uh, federal government and state and local uh, governments, uh, between the federal government and the private sector in both directions, both the federal government pushing more information out and the federal uh, government getting more information back uh, from the private sector, and between the federal government and our international partners, uh, because all of these uh, issues take place not just uh, domestically, but uh, on, in an international context as well. So certainly the White House has been very active uh, in this uh, issue, even just in the past few months, uh, from hosting the first uh, cybersecurity summit uh, and, and summit on consumer protection at Stanford University. Um, and through the executive order uh, that the president signed at the summit, uh, the presidential memorandum establishing uh, the, cyber the Cyber Threat uh, Intelligence Integration Center, or CTIC, and uh, renewing our push for cybersecurity legislation. Um, so, you know, I would say in this space uh, for us uh, in the White House, the, the good news has been that the president has been very personally interested in cybersecurity uh, and in these uh, issues. And the really bad news has been that the president has been personally interested uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these issues. Um, but either way, it's definitely been a really cool and interesting time to be working uh, in cyber. Uh, 
So let me talk a little bit about uh, the information sharing uh, executive order uh, that we issued back in February. Um, this executive order is really designed uh, to encourage and promote uh, the sharing of cybersecurity threat information uh, both within the private sector uh, and between the private sector and the government. Um, obviously, uh, you know, this kind of rapid information sharing is essential in several different uh, ways. Uh, both, I would say, at a tactical response level, but also at a more strategic level. Um, at the tactical level, we want to be able to be sharing this information in order to, uh, for us to be able to respond more effectively to particular incidents and uh, threats. Um, so a particular intrusion into a given company, we want more information there, and we want to be able to use that information to help us protect and defend other companies. Uh, and other organizations, and uh, frankly, also the federal government's own uh, assets. Um, but we also want this expanded information sharing at a very strategic level. Uh, you uh, will often hear uh, Phyllis Schneck from uh, the Department of Homeland Security talk about her idea for uh, a weather map of sorts, if you will, in cyberspace. Um, we very much want to create that ability for us to have strategic level awareness of what's happening in cyberspace what's coming over the horizon, what are the trends, where do we see the bad guys moving, where and how can we start to anticipate what that might look like, what will be their next move uh, once we take a particular defensive action so that we can be better positioned uh, to respond. Um, so it's both at that tactical and that strategic level that we want to, uh, that the executive order is really designed to uh, promote. And that executive order laid out a framework for expanded information sharing to help companies work together and to work with the federal government. Um, uh, that EO, 13691, uh, in particular encourages the development of information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISOWs, uh, to serve as focal points for cybersecurity information sharing and collaboration within the private sector and between the private sector and the government. So uh, those ISOWs are intended to accomplish four things. Um, first, we want them to make it easier for companies to trust each other uh, when sharing information um, because uh, the ISILs will uh, have a sort of defined set of standards for what they're supposed to meet in order to call themselves an ISIL. Uh, companies will have better uh, ability to trust that when they're sharing those uh, information with those uh, organizations, they know what those organizations will do uh, with their information. Um, second, uh, ISOWs are, will enable the sharing of information across sectors and regions, providing a different way to share information than uh, what we have now. Um, third, they will provide a partnership structure for DHS to connect with the private sector in uh, a way that is scalable. Um, obviously, we, we want to encourage as much participation, for example, uh, of the private sector uh, in uh, the NKIC. Uh, the National Cybersecurity uh, and Communications Integration Center at DHS, uh, but there is a physical limit to how many different companies you can jam in uh, there. So we have to create a way that is uh, physically scalable uh, to do the information sharing. Um, and fourth, they provide a framework for the private sector uh, information sharing uh, that legislation uh, can build on, uh, making uh, key legislative steps like tying targeted liability to those organizations uh, much more attainable. So this ISAO structure that we envision is much broader than the existing structure in several key ways. Um, and in particular, um, you know, the typical uh, organization that you, we talk about today are the ISACs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. Um, the ISACs have, don't have a statutory underpinning where ISAOs actually do. They're uh, enumerated in the Homeland Security Act of 2002. Um, and ISACs typically share information within a given sector. Uh, such as financial services or energy or health. And this kind of sharing has proven invaluable to cybersecurity, and we very much want to encourage that to keep happening. Um, and those organizations that are very, very strong, we want them to uh, keep going. Um, but we want to uh, enable this, the formation of structures that are different than that, if that's what the private sector needs in order to uh, fill, uh, fulfill its information sharing needs. Um, and so ISACs, are, in our view, are really a version of ISALs. They're a kind of ISAL. Uh, and uh, in fact, I would actually argue that um, I, the ISAL concept will only succeed if we learn all the lessons, some of them quite hard, one of how we have built the ISACs over the last few years. So 
um, ISALs can take on a whole bunch of different structures, including sharing information across regions and in response to particular threats um, or to uh, any number of other communities. Um, so this executive order is meant to uh, complement the administration's uh, legislative uh, proposals uh, that we sent forward, particularly with uh, targeted liability protection for uh, improving in, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so really this EO is designed to provide the framework for that trust and enhanced information sharing in the private sector. So uh, we also have rolled out the Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center, um, or CTIC. Um, in, in reviewing our cybersecurity capabilities over the last year, the administration really determined that we face some critical gaps internally uh, to the administration particularly involving the strategic analysis and integration of intelligence related to cyber threats. Um, and this is going beyond our uh, ability to assess particular incidents and threat indicators. This is about our ability to integrate that information across all of the different information streams that the U.S. government has, to discern the signal from the noise, if you will. How do we know what threats and risks we act to really ought to care about, uh, particularly from the national level, um, where, are the, where are our adversaries going? Um, and how should we position ourselves to counter uh, what they are doing? And how do we make determinations about how to improve the cybersecurity of uh, the nation? So the CTIC is really designed to help us fill that gap. And uh, the President directed the uh, Director of National Intelligence uh, to form the CTIC using his authorities under the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act to create uh, intelligence centers. And in many ways, CTIC will uh, serve a function similar to the National Counterterrorism Center does in counterterrorism, providing that all-source uh, analysis of threats and incidents uh, impacting U American national interests and closely supporting the operational work of uh, government cyber centers, making sure that they really have the best intelligence available about cyber threats and cyber actors in order for them to carry out their missions. Um, CTIC is really designed to be an internally facing organization. It's not designed to interact with the private sector. That's what we have DHS and the FBI and um, a whole alphabet soup, frankly, of federal agencies to do. Um, so the CTIC is really designed to do that knitting together on the back end, uh, to make that back end wiring and machinery work better so that all of those elements can do their job better and for those of you in the private sector, um, make our interaction with you actually better. Um, so if we do it right, you, mo the private sector will never see the CTIC, uh, but you will see the results uh, of their work uh, and what they do in enabling us to do a better job of uh, outreach and coordination. Uh, and then finally, I know that you will um, hear from uh, David Granis about uh, where the Congress is in legislation. Um, what I will say is that uh, from the administration side, you know, we kicked off uh, 2015 by uh, submitting a new uh, updated legislative uh, proposal in uh, cybersecurity uh, that included a cybersecurity information sharing bill, uh, a national data breach uh, notification standard, uh, and a bill to enhance uh, law enforcement tools for combating cybercrime. Um, and since that time, we've been working very closely uh, with all the uh, relevant committees up on the Hill on both the House and Senate side. Um, and I will say that uh, we've made tremendous progress uh, in this space, and, and I'm actually uh, more optimistic at this point than I've been in a while uh, that we can actually get to a piece of cybersecurity legislation that uh, can pass the Senate, pass the House, and that the President uh, will be able to sign. Um, from the administration's uh, point of view, you know, we are looking uh, to ensure that whatever we do in this space uh, actually promotes uh, greater information sharing that actually has the result of, of increasing the amount of information that flows between the private sector and the government, um, and that we don't authorize behavior that actually harms the, uh, the cyber ecosystem, um, and that also carefully protects um, privacy and civil liberties and preserves the longstanding respective roles and missions of civilian and intelligence uh, agencies in this area, and that has appropriately targeted uh, liability protections. So, um, you know, we're very encouraged um, by the work uh, that has happened, particularly what uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, has done and some of the changes they've put into their uh, bill to address some of the administration's concern. Um, and so while we still have some issues to uh, work through, um, I think that we're uh, confident that we have a path forward uh, to doing that. Um, we've, on the House side, we've also been very uh, closely engaged with both the House Intelligence Committee and 
the Homeland Security Committee on their uh, respective bills. Um, and so that we can, uh, again, we think we have a way to uh, work forward with uh, both of those uh, committees over there. So we're very committed to c striking that careful balance between facilitating information sharing and protecting privacy uh, and civil liberties. Um, and we're committed to working with Congress uh, to, uh, to get there. So these are just a few of the information sharing initiatives we uh, have going on uh, at the moment. All of these involve difficult and challenging questions and that balancing act that I mentioned between uh, protecting privacy and civil liberties, ensuring consumer protection, and ensuring the level of information flow that we need to actually provide actionable uh, information that somebody can uh, do something with to better protect their networks. Um, so we're going to continue our push uh, in this area. We, my office will be very focused on implementing the executive order on uh, information sharing, on uh, standing up the CTIC and getting that into a functioning uh, organization, working with uh, the Congress and uh, the committee staff up there to get to uh, acceptable cybersecurity legislation, uh, and many other projects in order to uh, both raise the level of uh, cybersecurity across our country, uh, to better disrupt uh, what the bad guys are doing, uh, and to respond to and recover from those uh, incidents when they occur. Um, so, you know, there's very few absolutes uh, in cybersecurity, um, and uh, there's no 100% uh, no answer in this space, as Jim knows uh, quite well. Uh, there's only doing better. Uh, so we will continue to uh, strive uh, to do better, and I think that uh, we're quite well along on that path. So thank you very much for letting me come and speak with you today. Great, thank you. Um, it is interesting to have sort of a historical perspective on this. So I was saying right before we came in, if you think about where we were seven or eight years ago and where we are now, there's been um, tremendous progress. Whether it's enough progress is something we can talk about. There's clearly more that needs to be done. But um, I think I get the uh, first question, and we'll have time for a couple more from the audience. And I warned Michael that my question would be, Tell us about how you're going to implement the executive order. What are the stages here? What are you going to be doing on it? Sure. So where we are right now is we are working very carefully with the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, in the executive order, they are directed to um, carry out a process to identify a uh, non-governmental organization or set of organizations that will identify the standards and best practices for uh, ISALs. And so we're in the process of soliciting uh, public comment and understanding uh, and getting, collecting input uh, from uh, the community, the standards community and others about how to actually go through and make that uh, selection process. Um, so that is one, where we, that's really where we are uh, at this process, uh, at this moment. We hope to uh, finish that up sometime uh, here in the spring and be able to move out over the summer with actually making uh, a selection. Um, of course, the other part of the EO that uh, is a little difficult to understand because it's written in EOEs, um, but the, uh, we also uh, in there fixed a long-standing problem with uh, the industrial security uh, clearance uh, program uh, to enable us to uh, be better able to grant security clearances uh, to the private sector for sharing of uh, cybersecurity information. I'm always hesitant a little bit to bring that up because um, we will never clear our way out of this problem, um, and so we tend not to be focused um, on that uh, quite as much, but it is a component of what we're trying to do. Great. Thank you. And let me say, too, that the, there's reserved seats in the front. If you're in the back, they're reserved for you, so feel free to come on up and, uh, and, and take advantage of them. Do we have any questions? I'm not going to ask a NISPOM question, and no <laughs> one is allowed to ask a NISPOM question. Yeah. But I see we have some questions from the floor. Why don't we do these three, and then we'll go across the room. So in the front row first, please. Uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you for your speech. Shen Yang from China Daily. Um, China's foreign ministry um, <laughs> spokeswoman uh, said the day before yesterday that he, she calls for the China calls for more international cooperation in the cybersecurity issues. So uh, my question is, how do you see this cooperation between China and the U.S.? Thank you. Sure. I mean, obviously, the relationship between China uh, and uh, the United States is one of the most important uh, bilateral relationships uh, that we have uh, in the 21st century. And uh, it is also an enormously complex one. 
that involves both areas of um, uh, it, high levels of uh, cooperation and some areas where um, we have some differences of opinion. And obviously in some of the cybersecurity areas um, is one of those that we've had some differences uh, with, uh, with the Chinese government over the last uh, few years. Um, my view is that despite that, um, this is an area that we have to figure out a way to work uh, better together. Um, we're two of the largest uh, economies in the world. Both of us are highly uh, internet and cyberspace dependent, and the Chinese are growing uh, only more so uh, every day as they modernize uh, their country. Uh, and I think in the long term it will be uh, in both of our interests to figure out how to combat uh, the cyber threats uh, that we face uh, more effectively. Great, thank you. We had uh, one in the front and then one in the uh, third to last row. Uh, if the ISACs, uh, there we go. Thank you. Hi, Rich Coleman. If the um, ISACs are focused on specific industries, are the ISACs for other industries not already covered or smaller companies, or how do those two relate? So it would be all of the above. So. Uh, in fact, you know, I would say that, again, you know, in our view, ISACs are kind of a flavor of uh, ISAO. Um, they're one a manifestation of uh, that kind of organization that we want to see. Um, I, I think really the, the thing that we're trying to promote here is sort of flexibility um, and the, enable the private sector to uh, organize itself um, along whatever lines it finds most useful for sharing the kinds of information that they need to. Uh, so in some instances, we've actually found that there are companies that have told us, you know, we actually need to be members of a couple of different organizations, one in our sector, one in our region, and one sort of for our supply chain. Um, and so we want to enable uh, all of those to get more formal, those flavors and those kinds to get more formal uh, recognition. Okay, uh, we had one in the back, and then I've got one over there. Leander Bernstein, Sputnik International News. A uh, question about the executive order from this morning uh, targeting cyber, cyber criminals with sanctions. Uh, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Are there enough suspects that you, you can have a designated sanctions list? Uh, what countries do you anticipate a lot of these individuals uh, being connected to? Uh, yeah, just discuss the sure. executive order. So this morning, the president uh, issued uh, an executive order uh, that will enable us to target malicious uh, cyber activity uh, with economic sanctions. Um, it's so new it doesn't even have an uh, executive order number on it yet, uh, since the president only signed it at 845 this morning. Um, but uh, essentially, what this order does is it enables us to impose economic sanctions on uh, actors, uh, entities, or organizations, um, individuals, entities, organizations that uh, pose a significant threat to the national security, the foreign policy, the economic health or financial stability of the United States, and that meet one of four harms, uh, enumerated harms in the executive order. So. Uh, an attack uh, or disruption of our critical infrastructure or critical infrastructure services, uh, the disruption of computer networks on a wide scale, uh, the theft of trade secrets, um, personal information or financial information, or sort of aiding and abetting, the knowing receipt of or aiding and abetting those, uh, those, stolen, uh, those stolen goods or uh, one of the other two uh, activities. So really, this is a uh, new authority for us. Uh, we don't have a specific set of targets at this time because we felt it was important to get this uh, authority in place to enable us to both deal with any uh, future incidents that might occur that rise to this level, but also to deter uh, uh, as a piece of deterrence for those that uh, have been thinking that they can hide behind borders where there are weak governments or weak cyber laws or governments that aren't willing to cooperate. And so this is really a tool that's designed for us to be able to uh, use in cases where um, we don't believe our existing tools of diplomacy and law enforcement and others uh, are adequate or appropriate. Um, it's not one that we expect to be using um, you know, every day, um, but it is one that we uh, anticipate that we will be able to use in a very targeted uh, and judicious manner. Um, the reason it is not tied to any particular country um, or region um, 
or set of actors currently is because we wanted a tool that was flexible enough to apply to wherever uh, those actors uh, are and uh, wherever they may be coming from. Um, it's also designed to, is, uh, because of the receipt uh, and uh, aiding and abetting idea is that uh, not just the actual hackers on the keyboard, uh, but those that are bankrolling them uh, and those that are supporting them and giving them their strategic direction for what to go do. Um, so we wanted to build a tool that uh, was clearly uh, targeted and would be used uh, judiciously and carefully, but also was broad enough to actually have uh, an impact in uh, the cyber ecosystem. Um, it's really, uh, you know, the culmination of several uh, years worth of work inside the administration to uh, design this tool, uh, and I think it's a very exciting uh, step forward for us uh, in adding to the capabilities that the federal government has to combat uh, the cyber threat that we face. I mean, just do a quick follow-up on that one. There's two bits that uh, leap out from the fact sheet, at least, and the first is uh, malicious uh, cyber action, which um, some people say was uh, a source of uh, debate within the administration. And the second one is the use of the word uh, significant, which to people who are familiar with the federal process looks like one of those compromise words that you put in front of everything. Can you tell us about malicious cyber action and what the judgment will be on significant? So I think the, the, the essential framing behind this is we want to be very clear that if you're talking about sanctions, they need to be used in the pursuit of uh, our national level interest and uh, in used carefully in, uh, as I said, judiciously. Uh, so the reason for the word significant is that this is not something that's meant to be used to promote the narrow interests of any one particular U.S. company. Um, it, it has to be something that actually rises to a level of national concern. And that was the use of the term significant uh, very uh, deliberately. Um, the term malicious cyber activity, we wanted to uh, arrive at a term that uh, obviously denoted something bad, um, that, uh, hence the use of the term malicious, um, but we were also trying to ena enable us not to get locked into terms like attack um, and other sorts of things that you have a lot of debate about, but enable a broad enough definition that we could encompass the wide range of theft and intrusions and the kinds of bad behavior that is endemic, uh, unfortunately, in cyberspace. Okay. Um, we have one over here and then one in the back. So can we get this one up front? And then I think that'll be it. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Raleigh Flynn, Singa Consulting in Georgetown University. Um, could you comment a little bit more on CTIC? How exactly are you going to be staffing it? Will you be pulling from other government agencies hiring contractors. I know with the stand-up of the NCTC, that was an issue. Also, how big is CTIC envisioned to become? Sure. So uh, CTIC is designed to deliberately um, be a streamlined and, and small uh, organization. Um, so it will primarily be uh, staffed by detailees and assignees from other uh, federal entities, um, although um, it may well have some permanent staff uh, of its own to ensure some continuity. Uh, I am sure that it will also be um, augmented to a certain degree with uh, contractors uh, in, uh, to support uh, the workforce. Um, our target number is around 50 um, people for this organization, so not an overly, uh, well, I mean, if you're from the National Security Council staff, that sounds like a very large uh, organization. If you're from a line agency, that's not a very large organization. So ultimately not a, a very large uh, entity to uh, do this because um, the goal is to leverage the existing capabilities, the very, very robust capabilities that we've built um, at the agencies, but to knit them together more effectively. Um, so really, um, the, it's really that integration and support function that, that CTIC is designed to do. Um, I suspect that, um, you know, we want to, um, we're driving towards, uh, you know, having uh, CTIC start producing products um, over the next few months, but I'm sure that it's one that we will uh, try some things out and we'll uh, discover that some things work really, really well and we'll decide on some others, wow, that was, sounded really good on paper and doesn't work so well in practice and we'll uh, make adjustments. Uh, one in the back there, I think. Uh, Michael and, uh, Eisenberg uh, uh, speaking uh, in my capacity as a member of the ABA Information Security Committee leadership. Uh, harking back to the remarks at the very end of your statement about selection and engagement with uh, organizations, uh, 
going back to the start of PCIS, healthcare, for example, was a challenge because of the diversity. Uh, has there been discussions or is, are there views about the way to deal with uh, critical sectors that are diverse? And I'm thinking in particular about the law and the legal profession, which, uh, like healthcare, is not a monolith and uh, presents a challenge in terms of engagement about uh, security practices. Sure. I mean, I think that one of the one of the lessons that I've been learning um, over my time in this job is that, um, in fact, the really, really big companies in all the sectors tend to look more alike um, than they are different across the sectors, and that the really small uh, entities look very different uh, and are actually more similar to each other across the sectors than sort of you know, being the same across those sectors in that, you know, the really large companies tend to have the ability to in, invest fairly significant sums of money in, you know, a cyber intelligence unit and uh, that sort of thing. So one of the questions that we've been, you know, sort of wrestling with is how do we promote policies to enable, you know, sort of the small and medium-sized enterprises, um, you know, in those uh, various sectors to, you um, you know, more effectively consume uh, information that may be pushed out to the information sharing and analysis organizations. And how do you actually create sort of this uh, virtuous market for the larger firms to provide those services uh, in that uh, sector? Looking at and asking, working with those sectors, trying to develop very deep partnerships with them to say, what kinds of information are most useful to you? What do you actually need from the federal government? Where's the federal government's value add um, in this uh, space um, so that we actually are, uh, in fact, uh, raising the level of cybersecurity, uh, not just in little pockets, but sort of across the board. Uh, final question, and I'll do it. Um, you've, you've actually put out a lot of stuff. It's, it is hard to keep up. What's next, to the extent you can say? What <laughs> is it? You know, you have uh, two years left, uh, more or less, in the administration. What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? Where do you hope these EOs will end up? So, an uh, easy question. Yep. So, um, I think that, you know, in very, you know, we're going to continue to focus on uh, sort of, I think, really three very core areas to us. Um, you know, sort of how do we raise the level of cybersecurity for the United States, both in the short term and in the long term? Um, you know, and I put in the long term category, one of my favorite passions is killing off the password. Uh, killing it dead uh, as a security measure. Um, how do we disrupt uh, and, and counter what the adversaries are doing in this space? Um, Jim, one of the conversations you and I have had uh, frequently is sort of the emergence of cyber as a tool of statecraft. Uh, that is something that we are going to have to uh, adapt ourselves to uh, in this space. And then finally, how do we build the federal government's capability uh, to manage and respond to and recover from cyber incidents effectively. Um, they, we are, no matter how good we get at our, doing our defenses, no matter how good we get at countering and disrupting what the bad guys do, sometimes they're going to be successful. So how do we actually respond to uh, those events in a very effective way? So we're going to keep pushing on policies. We're going to keep focused on implementing the policies that we've uh, pushed out. We're going to keep uh, focused on working with Congress to get to uh, cyber legislation. And we're going to keep looking at policies in those areas that, that I laid out so that we can really make some progress against this and, and leave the country materially uh, better off. Okay, well, great. Uh, good agenda. Pretty ambitious, but I like it. Uh, let's join me in thanking uh, Michael for his presentation. Thank you very much. Now what I'd like to do is ask uh, Denise Shung, uh, my compatriot here at CSIS, to come up, introduce the panel. If the panel members could come up as well, uh, we'll now go to the second part of the... Hello, uh, I'm Denise Jung, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow here at the Strategic Technologies Program at CSIS. Uh, next is a discussion about an effort that's being piloted in the electric utility sector called the Cybersecurity Risk Information Sharing Program, also known as CRISP. 
At a very high level, uh, CRISP is a voluntary uh, information sharing program that facilitates the exchange of cyber information between electric utilities and the Department of Energy. It involves specialized sensors installed on the networks of participating entities that collect and transmit information in real time. And it enables the government to share sensitive cyber threat indicators and intelligence back. In many ways, this is a new and novel approach, innovative approach to sharing cybersecurity information within a select community with significant inter interdependencies and that also face advanced cyber threats. So our panel is going to discuss this program, including its benefits, its challenges, and whether it could serve as a model for information sharing programs in other sectors. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, Michael Smith, uh, to my right, uh, he is the Senior Cyber Policy Advisor to the Assistant Secretary, Office of Electricity Delivery and Ele Energy Reliability, Department of Energy. Uh, Tim Roxy, he is the Chief Security Officer and Senior Director for the Electricity Sector Information Sharing and Analysis Center uh, for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Scott Aronson, Senior Director uh, for National Security Policy at the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, Greg Nojime, he is Senior Counsel and Director for Freedom, Security, and Technology at the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT. And Shane McGee, he is the Chief uh, Privacy Officer at FireEye. And so at this point, I would like to invite our panelists to each give brief remarks, approximately 10 minutes, and then we'll uh, do Q&A. Thanks. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I'm the CRIS program manager. I've been so since uh, August 2012. Uh, the program was uh, kind of uh, floundering at that point, and we uh, had to come up with a way to get it restarted. I think everybody saw the benefit, uh, potential benefit, and uh, so it took uh, at least a lot of hard work over a couple of years to get it up and running again. Um, so various legal policy and financial barriers exist to sharing cybersecurity threat information. Security clearances, need to know, fear of regulatory noncompliance, fines, shareholder expectations, civil liberties, and privacy. At the, at the same time, a growing number of companies uh, are collecting, analyzing, and selling extremely valuable, actionable, unclassified cyber threat information in many cases with attribution. The government cannot and should not compete with these companies. So given this situation, how does the government make the case that critical infrastructure owners and operators should share more information? What can we offer that these best-in-class companies can't? Classified government information. So that's kind of the, the heart of what we're trying to do with this uh, collaboration. So the CRIS program is, a, as, as you've heard described, a public-private partnership, and I think you all have a handout that at a high level des um, describes the basic infrastructure and data flow process of uh, how we started. Uh, I would correct one thing you said, called it a pilot still. Uh, I officially changed the P and CRIS to program uh, about a year and a half ago when the electric sector decided to uh, partner with us and take it and run with it. So uh, it, it's no longer a pilot, although we are to fulfill our role is kind of the uh, improving the program, looking for ways to improve it. We are conducting a series of operational pilots to test out technologies, and we'll talk a little bit about more of that later. So. <clears throat> the purpose of CRISP is to collaborate with our sector partners and to facilitate the timely bi-directional sharing of information as close to machine speed as we can, that's our goal, uh, and develop situational awareness tools that can help improve our situation awareness and our sector partners. So DOE performs and funds the classified analysis and we conduct these operational pilots, as I mentioned, while the electricity subsector funds basically everything else themselves. And that was always the vision of the, the pilot was that if this was beneficial to industry and they 
decided to move forward with it, uh, that eventually it would transition to that type of arrangement. So it's worked out fantastic, and uh, NERC, uh, the courage it took and uh, the department to uh, decide to move forward with this uh, is, is a pretty groundbreaking partnership. The vast majority of actionable cyber threat information, as I mentioned, is unclassified, and it's in the possession of the private sector. While the government has classified government information and in all threat intelligence information, um, it doesn't get that real-time information from the critical infrastructure owners and operators. So what we try and do is to make that value and this make the partnership uh, work is we call it an enrichment process. Um, we take the information that they voluntarily decide to share with us and the department analyzes it using classified information to see if there are gaps, trends, the picture they have of a broader understanding of what's hitting all sectors in the U.S. and how we can declassify that as quickly as possible and push it back out to the partners, hopefully at machine speed, but until then at least as fast as we can. So by focusing on that last mile of actionable, actionable threat information, CRISP is not attempting to compete with managed cybersecurity service industry or duplicate the energy sector expertise that resides in each of the CRISP companies and at their information sharing and analysis center. We, we can't duplicate the expertise in those companies or the understanding of the sector that the ESISAC has or that those companies have. So the original pilot started with technology uh, developed at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and that's what uh, NERC and the ESISAC are, are using uh, as they go forward. So that allows us to step, take a step back and start experimenting, checking other technologies that are out there to see how we can help improve every process, every aspect of CRISP, speed it up, make it as, as more uh, useful and uh, tailored to what the sector needs as possible. Now, while some energy companies have very robust cyber uh, programs, Michael mentioned uh, the vast scale of sophistication that's out there, uh, we have the same thing in the energy sector. So not every company has those capabilities of some of the large ones. So, but almost every company in the sector, whether electric or oil and gas, has some type of network monitoring capability. So our eventual long-term goal is to allow companies to come into CRISP with whatever technology they have in place. If they have some type of network capturing information that they want to share with us, in whatever fashion, we hope to bring them in so that we can protect the companies that are connected to the larger sophisticated companies in some way, but do not have their resources. The full and successful implementation of CRISP CRISP is an ongoing, enduring program, will require both industry and government to address and mitigate all of the sensitive legal and policy concerns that we've been addressing for the last two years. It's, it's not a one and done issue. We, we have to continuously look at ways to minimize the data that they're sharing, autonomically remove PII or, or private information in, in focus it as fast as possible on true cybersecurity information. So that's, that's kind of what we're, we're searching for. And uh, the transition from our small pilot to uh, NERC and their companies coming in was a perfect example of how bringing their lawyers and their expertise to the table to work through these issues strengthened every protection and, and issue that we dealt with in the beginning of the program to protect privacy and civil liberties better than in thought of things that we did not think of at the pilot phase. And that's, that's what, exactly what should have happened. And those protections are, are very well thought out and spend a lot of time on negotiating those. So I guess the key takeaways I would say is that the current Chris privacy and civil liberty, liberty protections are robust and reflect hours of coordination among the interagency and with our private sector partners but we need to keep working harder to make sure that uh, 
we can even improve that. Uh, DOE is committed to this partnership and will continue to investigate ways to enhance CRIS information sharing and reduce cost as much as we can for the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Tim Roxy? <coughs> So I am uh, Tim Roxy. I am the Chief Security Officer for NERC, um, and I'm the Senior Director of the ESISAC. So NERC is a private sector entity. Uh, we're a not-for-profit. We have roughly 1,800 to 2,000 registered entities, which are in compliance with the NERC CIP standards. And we also have many others within the electric sector who are not members of, of NERC itself, but are members of the ESISAC. We are North America-wide to include uh, OCONUS uh, areas as well, and we integrate with the other Friendly Five Eyes and other ISACs around the globe. So it's a big dang deal for us to be involved uh, with the CRISP program. Uh, we are seriously a public-private partnership. Uh, we are embedded with various uh, public community agencies such as DHS and DOE, among others, and also very tight relationships with a variety of private sector companies to include other sectors as well. Uh, we, we hold daily inter-ISAC inter calls, so we coordinate on a daily basis the tempo of tactical information sharing between all critical infrastructure. Um, I kind of want to say that CRISP is designed to, to address or partially address one of the more difficult challenges in cybersecurity that you hear uh, discussed in a variety of different ways. Sometimes you hear a statement that says it's almost two years or it's 208 days or it's pick some time frame, it doesn't matter, before you're actually aware of a compromise from the time you trace it back and realize that you were compromised. So the way a friend of mine, Paul Stockton, would frame this, it's left and right of boom. Uh, our lives are, are a series of events, left and right of boom. Left of boom, you're on vacation, you're fishing, you come out to the parking lot, your tire's flat, you didn't prepare for it, now you gotta deal with it. So CRISP now is designed to be that detection function right in the middle. It amplifies, it enriches uh, through classified networks, and it also enriches through a lot of open source intelligence information, the information that a particular single entity may be seeing. When you take that single entity information and pass that detail of whatever they're seeing back into the company, it helps the company improve their training, their ability to respond, and to mitigate these issues. However, as we know, typically one company is not the only one suffering a particular piece of pain. It's shared across many, many companies. So what the ISAC does, the value add here, is that we will actually take that information back, strip attribution, and parse the information into a protected portal, encrypted in some cases, so that the vast majority of the other companies in the electricity sector can participate in, in, in fixing that. Uh, the details are, um, Pretty, pretty intense. Uh, the information sharing device uh, basically captures packets. Uh, it uses four different types of technologies to evaluate that. Each of these technologies has a data protection privacy um, descriptor with it that says even though this technology can take this kind of data, the collection that we need is only going to take these few pieces. All the rest is going to be dropped at collection, so it does not even go into the national labs. We scrub it as hard as we can before we even pass it up there. Uh, the uh, initial um, anal analysis of this is actually performed by a series of very sophisticated algorithms, uh, and then the basis of those algorithms, when they, when they uh, start to generate the report function, it goes to a system of a network of human analysts who tear down through the information uh, and put context, open source sometimes, sometimes classified context to it, uh, all with the intent of creating a package of information to go back to the entity who had the ISD system that gave you the data to start with, but also to horizontally integrate that information across all the other classified and unclassified networks we have, and then to share it across the sector. Uh, so the ESI SEC, again, would be uh, the, the functional vehicle through which all the electricity sector would be sharing this information, and we are targeting to try and move to taxi and sticks framework, for anybody who's familiar with those, um, and uh, that would be a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, framework, and we also use, uh, from DOE, the cyber-federated model, which DOE uses, which is also a machine-to-machine, -machine, heavily encrypted, all, always, so the, the information is always in motion, heavily encrypted. And that's where we are. The, um, the actual document, 
which is shared amongst all the entities, uh, is about 60, 70 pages long that describes in exquisite detail every field that the technology can capture and the requirements for privacy concerns associated with every field and which fields are needed and which fields are not, they're simply not collected. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Scott? Here we go. Thanks, Denise, and thank you to CSIS for uh, holding this today, and thanks to uh, my colleagues who are up here. Um, I think we're going in exactly the right order. So Mike and DOE uh, and the government helped to develop this technology. NERC and Tim and the Electric Sector Information Sharing Analysis Center are helping to uh, manage it. And my members, uh, the electric utilities around the nation uh, and, the, and uh, Canada as well, are benefiting from it. So what I want to do is sort of explain how we got to where we are and then what the industry's perspective is and sort of why we have bought into this the way that we have. I think it's an instructive uh, viewpoint for other sectors who are looking to, uh, as Michael Daniel put earlier, really deal with the most foundational thing that we can do as a nation dealing with cyber events, and that is to improve the sharing of information. Um, so in addition to my day job as uh, a member of uh, EEI's Government Relations Department, uh, I am actually 95% of the time the Secretary of the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. Uh, I'll give a little background on what the ESCC is and what it does and how it relates specifically uh, to the CRISP program and where we are today. Um, without too much history lesson, uh, NIAC, uh, the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, uh, has put out a bunch of reports over the years uh, about how can we improve our security posture to protect that critical infrastructure that primarily is owned and operated by the private sector, uh, but which has a critical component to the life, health, and safety of Americans. Traditionally, a really government-focused perspective, but uh, obviously we, uh, we, the critical infrastructure owners and operators, have a little something to say about it and do uh, with it. So in 2011, uh, NIAC wrote a report about electric and nuclear sector resilience. They said there ought to be a senior executive dialogue between CEOs and senior administration officials. We said, yes, there should be that, and wrote a letter to the president. Uh, that first letter was ignored. We wrote a second uh, in May of 2012, and that one was responded to. The intervening event was Fukushima, and the administration saw that the Japanese government was effectively setting policy in the middle of a crisis. I am very fond of quoting uh, my engineers, uh, that is suboptimal. <laughs> so we got commitment to work together, and we are now working together at a very high level on a very regular basis at a very fast pace. Uh, the ESCC is comprised of 30 CEOs and trade association heads representing the entire electric utility industry. If you think of the electric grid, it is one big machine with thousands of owners, users, and operators. We have to work and play nicely together. We have to keep this, this, this big machine operational. So the CEOs who have a lot of value to this, you know, people joke, CEOs don't do work. No, they don't, but they set policy, they set strategy, they provide resources. They are themselves a draw that brings other folks to the table that help us to do more, better, faster. In this particular case, that was bringing senior administration officials to the table. When the folks in the corner office, both industry and government care about something, you can do things quickly. And the deployment of CRISP is an example of that, and I'll go into a little bit more detail. The CEOs, uh, about two years ago now, uh, with, the, with the administration said, we're gonna focus on four things. Here's what we're gonna work on. Information sharing, making sure the right people are getting the right information at the right time. Tools and technology, the government has some cool toys, we want those on our system. Improving incident response, to Michael's point and others, you can't protect everything from everything. What do you do when something goes wrong? And then cross-sector coordination. No one component has uh, a monopoly on good information. And frankly, if you think about the electric utility system, everybody likes to focus on us as the most critical of the critical. Everybody relies on us. If we don't have water, we can't generate steam or cool our system. If we don't have telecom, we can't operate. If we don't have transportation or pipelines, we can't move our fuel, so on and so forth. The interdependencies across the sectors are profound, and so we are focusing on that as well. If you think about CRISP and the, de and the description that you've heard uh, from Tim and Mike, it effectively addresses in one component or another all four of those missions. Tools and tech, well, it's a tool and a technology de developed by the government, managed by NERC and deployed by the industry. 
information sharing. It does information sharing, and it does it at a machine-to-machine, -machine, or will be, uh, hopefully, uh, in the future, doing it at a machine-to-machine -machine level. At the very least, it's getting toward machine-to-machine. -machine. Incident response gives us a sense of when we're going to be, to use Tim's language, right of boom. And cross-sector, it is a platform. Uh, if you look at some of the other sectors who have done some interesting things in this space, uh, they are developing, you know, think financial services and the Sultra Edge project. We can benefit from that. They might be able to benefit from CRISP. How are we, and Tim is at the center of this, sharing information across the ISACs through the NCIC bilaterally among the interdependent sectors? Again, CRISP is a facilitator of that. So that's how we got CEOs and senior administration officials to say about a year ago now, deploy it. Not a, pro not a pilot anymore. It's a project. We want it. We want the ISAC to be at the center of this, and we need these tools and technologies to help improve our capabilities and improve our situational awareness. People often say that relationships are complicated, legal ones more so. And when you think about the entities that are a part of this now legal relationship, contractual relationship, the Department of Energy and the government more broadly, NERC and the ESISAC, dozens and growing numbers of utilities who are deploying. Uh, if you think about, and Greg is going to get to this, I assume, the privacy implications of all of this. We spent the first part of last spring just figuring out what we had to do. The CEOs then, uh, led by Tom Fanning, the CEO of Southern Company, uh, uh, threatened to lock us in a room <laughs> until we got it figured out. That kick in the pants is what we needed, and we were able to actually uh, get everybody to the table, weekly calls, working through every element of this legal relationship that was going to allow us to deploy this technology with the ISAC at the center of it, with a classified component of it, uh, and a government project, that, uh, pro developed project, into the hands of the private sector so that they could use it in a way that honored the privacy concerns uh, that were not insignificant, uh, and the privacy of the companies and, the, and their, uh, uh, and their uh, employees. Uh, things, again, that were not insignificant. Uh, we created a memorandum of understanding, and what we effectively have now is a boilerplate that every company that wants to deploy CRISP is able to sign on to, create a scope of work unique to their company, and deploy in what has become about a six to eight week process. So if you think about where we were with a five, excuse me, a five company pilot a few, uh, a few years ago, uh, and to where we're going, where we're hoping to have tens, dozens, if not more, companies in the future, we had to make it as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, that's where we are legally today, and that is how we deploy this technology. Uh, Tim, throughout the number 1,900. There are 1,900 uh, utilities who make up the bulk electric system. They are called registered entities. That's the term of art. We will never get 1,900 companies. That's okay. What we want to do is get a good cross-section regionally by the type of company. Uh, I represent investor-owned. There's cooperatively owned. There's municipally owned. There's Canadian. How can we get this into the hands of a good cross-section of people? And then once we've done that, how can Tim's shop use the information uh, that is gleaned from the dozens of companies that deploy and socialize it and put it into the hands of all owners, users, and operators? Some who choose not to participate, some who simply can't afford to participate. That is the model that we have created for the electric utility system uh, and one that we think works well for us. Clearly, other sectors will have other approaches, but again, these were the pitfalls and sort of issues that we had to cope with in order to make for a more streamlined and effective deployment of what we think is a very valuable tool to, excuse me, improve the situational awareness uh, of cyber threats for the electric utility grid. So with that, I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Now we'll turn to Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Nojan with the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT, my organization is a nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington. We have an office in San Francisco, and we have folks in Brussels and London, and we like to say that we're dedicated to keeping the Internet open, innovative, and free. Um, my organization has been pretty deeply involved in the debates around cybersecurity, uh, information sharing legislation, 
uh, because of the privacy implications that we see uh, in the proposals that have come. I have to confess I don't know as much about the CRISP program as the other panelists who have gone before me, and I would submit that that's not a good thing. Uh, not good for me, and perhaps not good for the idea that the program might be translatable into other sectors. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of the privacy community um, would have concerns about is the extent to which the program and programs like it are transparent so that people actually know what are the privacy protections that have been built in um, and are they effective and exactly what information is being shared, how is the PII being stripped out. These are all things that are being discussed actively now in Washington. There's a lot of folks who are very sensitive to that information and I would just submit that uh, more transparency about that would be a good thing for, um, for this whole program. Uh, one thing that um, I like is the idea of finding approaches to solve and deal with the issues that come up when the government gets involved with the cybersecurity information sharing activities. In the legislative context, those have mostly, well, they have often centered around when personally, personally identifiable information is shared as part of the cyber threat information shared so that people can help protect each other from cyber threats. Um, it will necessarily include some PII, uh, personally identifiable information, and it will sometimes include personally identifiable information that isn't necessary to share. How is that gonna be dealt with? And what steps are taken to minimize the sharing of that information? Those are the concerns that really uh, I think are uh, coming up a lot in the in the debate around the legislation, and um, it's good to hear that uh, panelists are concerned about that. Um, when that information goes to a governmental entity, additional concerns come up. How will that entity use it? Is the entity um, in the intelligence area where, um, let's just say, uh, some agencies have been rather promiscuous in their um, gathering of information, including information about persons in the United States. Uh, will it be turned to non-cybersecurity purposes, such as criminal prosecutions? Now, I don't know what the rules are for the CRISP program, but I would suggest that uh, uh, rules that prohibit non-cyber use of the information being shared would be a good thing. It's also, it's also not entirely clear to me what data is going back to FERC, or back to the Department of Energy, and what data does not go, what data is scrubbed out and does not go. And I think some additional uh, clarification would be uh, useful in that regard. Um, we're also, we've also been asked to think about whether the model that's been discussed and described could be applied outside of the energy sector. Um, I, I think it might be appropriate for some other sectors, but I don't know if it would be appropriate to what I would call the public facing sectors, the sectors that are gonna deal with a lot of um, personal communications, consumer communications, as opposed to um, what might um, be shared within the uh, energy sector. I'll stop there and hope to continue learning more. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Shane McGee. I'm Chief Privacy Officer for FireEye, uh, and that's just in the last year. Prior to that, I was uh, General Counsel for a local security company here called Mandiant. Uh, I am, as a Chief Privacy Officer, I think I'm in a unique position on this panel because I'm both from a company, an executive in a company that sells information sharing services and products, including those that may be involved with this program at some point, but being the CPO, I'm also a privacy advocate, which means I'm an advocate for our customers and protect, in charge of protecting their information, the confidentiality of their information. So I, I try to, to balance the, uh, the two extremes in this discussion. And I, I think probably the best thing I could do here is to go through and explain why I think uh, that this program, the CRISP program, is, 
probably one of the better, if not the best, framework that I've seen in terms of balancing both the privacy and the uh, security uh, issues on information sharing. So let me just go through some of the points that, that I have, including some you saw me tapping while the others were talking. Uh, so I think anything that reduces direct collection by the government of information is hopefully going to, and Greg, I, I look forward to getting some of these details too uh, in the Q&A, so I'll try to keep my uh, comments short so we can get to those questions. But I think that any program that limits direct uh, government access to the raw data is the only type of program that's going to really pass muster from a public uh, standpoint and those with privacy advocates. The arguments that I've heard uh, on including those on the Hill this morning in a meeting about another information security or information sharing bill is uh, the, the privacy advocates are um, disturbed mostly by the government have, using this as a backdoor to collect more raw data about its citizens. Um, so I think that the, the ability to send this, to keep this in a private-public partnership but in a privately owned framework is incredibly important and is unique uh, to this CRISP program. Uh, the, there has to be in the process at least one, probably more, times when we're going to be able to scrub personal information from this data stream, and that was something that uh, Mike and others focused on, and that's, a, I think, another great point about this program. What we can't do, though, is uh, what a number of the privacy advocates have come out and suggested, which is to have kind of a strict liability in terms of any company that's providing information, even if some incidental personal information gets by. If you have any type of liability associated with that, then there's not going to be enough participants in a voluntary program like this. Uh, so there has to be some sort of um, compromise there. And I think the bill that we were talking about this morning talked about reasonable efforts to remove personal information. Um, and I think that uh, that has to be the standard going forward, both for this and for others. Now, Greg, you said transparency. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. We have to absolutely include privacy groups uh, from the bottom up in the planning and implementation of this program, of uh, the legislation that's being written elsewhere. It, the, my experiences at, at FireEye have been uh, largely trying to convince uh, a large customer base that they have more to gain from having us uh, on their network with pretty extraordinary access to their network than they do by uh, not having a company that's looking out for their security. There's always that balance. There's that natural tension between privacy and security. You have to give up a little privacy to get the security that we need these days. Uh, so I think that's an example there uh, where tr you, you have to make that argument and you have to include the privacy advocates and convince them of that. And the only way you can do that is to involve them from the very beginning. Uh, what you can't do when you're talking about personal information is to broaden that definition to include data that we really do need when it, we talk about information sharing. I'm talking about IP addresses, MAC addresses, things like that, whereas if we applied, for example, the European Union's definition of personal information, uh, then we would be restricting ourselves from exchanging absolutely vital data, data that we really can't effectively uh, create a program like this without trading. And then uh, we also have to do, I think this goes back kind of to the question about government collection. When the government is involved in receiving any of the raw data, there are legal regimes in place that require um, big scary banner ads. Would that be the technical term, Mike? Big scary banner ads. Yeah, we need to have, uh, I think by, inv by making this a privately owned, privately run program, uh, you can get away from some of the bureaucracy around uh, information collection and sharing, and I think that's also a good thing. And finally, again, I think probably the best point here is that privacy is advanced and promoted by programs like this. At Mandiant, now by Fire, at FireEye, we see time and time again serial compromises over and over again by the same groups using the same tools, tactics, and procedures. They compromise one company, they use the same malware and techniques for the next company and then the next, whereas if those companies down the line, not A, but B, C, D, and E, had been a part of a robust information sharing program, they would have received information about that particular compromise early on and it would have prevented a number of additional compromises.
Thank you. So before we um, take questions from the audience, I wanted to just pose a couple questions to the panel. Um, so we've heard that one of the major impediments to uh, improved cyber security information sharing is the potential for the information shared to be used for regulatory purposes. In this case, it's kind of unique, right? So NERC is the industry regulator. Well, the industry self-regulator, I guess you could call it. But <laughs> you have utilities sharing directly uh, to their regulator. Um, so my question is, you know, has this posed any unique challenges? I think somebody had mentioned that there are currently five uh, companies who are signed up for the program. Has this created any challenges in terms of getting folks to sign up? Um, how have you addressed these challenges? Um, how have you guys overcome that? So the... Um NERC is indeed a regulator. It gets its authority from FERC, which you mentioned. He's DOE, by the way. Um, I just want to make that clear. It gets its authorities under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act. If you look at Section 215 of the Federal Power Act, it said go find an ERO and give that ERO the ability to create standards and do compliance management and enforcement. Well, if you go back to 1998, uh, at the beginning of, I'll get the number wrong, PPD something or other, 63, I think it was, uh, that came out of the executive branch, right? And when you come out of the executive branch, you don't have the same legislative authorities that you have out of the legislative branch to impugn sanctions and penalties, et cetera, the regulatory function. However, you do get the information sharing function. So when you follow the HSPD-7, PPD, whatever it is, and I'm sure you folk can track this much better than me, but out of the executive branch, you get into HSPD-7, you get into the NIP, you get into the public-private partnership framework, and you start the conversation around ISACs, and to Michael's point earlier, we are actually an ISAO as well, right, because information sharing and analysis organization. So when you come into that framework, then you do not have the regulatory component. So the ES-ISAC does not have the regulatory component. However, it receives Section 215 funding for the boots on the ground and the equipment of our fingertips. In order to clarify this, the Board of Trustees has written two different policy statements that isolate the ESISAC from all compliance management and enforcement information, which means I don't do names at all. Um, I do security. I do not do names. I won't tell you how many are in the program. I won't tell you who they are. I won't tell you the kind of data that we're collecting and analyzing or who I'm sharing it with because I don't want even the implication that my team or myself is talking to compliance management and enforcement, even in circuitous routes. So with several sets of board of trustees, and they're my boss's boss, right? So that's the people at the top. They have uh, discussed this openly in the public amongst all the utility um, Asset owner operators, they've discussed it in front of FERC. All the way across the line, there is now a, a barrier between the Section 215 funded regulatory aspect and the executive orders and HSPD 7 public private partnership coming out of the executive branch that creates the ISAO and ISACs. So, this, this is a non statutory mandated function out of the executive branch. Ergo, I am not part of the regulator now. That took a little bit of education, took a little conversation around the industry, but I think we are pretty much down that path. Uh, people tend to trust us quite a bit with sensitive information. So I'll echo something Tim said. Um, yes, Denise, there was a problem, and we had to educate a bit. Um, there is concern with sharing information that could be held and used against you in a regulatory proceeding. Um, the fun metaphor that I like to use is you wouldn't go to marriage counseling with your attorney, so you want to be in a place where you can share information freely and openly for the benefit of all, and we needed to prove to people that, in fact, the ESISAC, which is a unit of NERC, but is its own separate entity, uh, was not in fact breaching that trust. And uh, uh, Tim and his team have done a lot of work to socialize that message and to do the things, the basic belts and suspenders that need to be done to isolate the information that they are collecting uh, and to isolate themselves from the broader compliance and enforcement functions that NERC also does. Uh, that is ongoing, and in fact, the ESCC uh, is undergoing a review of the ISAC, uh, and one of the things that uh, is being looked at is how can we even do a better job of ensuring uh, that trust? Because the second that that tr trust is breached, this program goes away because every company that is a part of it will say, 
I can't trust it. The things that I am sharing are now going to be held and used against me. I'm done. And then this crumbles under its own weight, and that's terrible. And Tim and his team understand the existential threat and are doing everything that they can and should be doing uh, to ensure that that never happens. So I think this, um, this discussion actually leads to some of the points that Greg and Shane made about privacy and transparency. And it sounds like, you know, Tim, you had mentioned you're not disclosing who's participating or even, you know, what type of information has been shared at a detailed level. So how do we get the transparency we need to assure people that, that their privacy is being protected while addressing these other concerns? Um, actually, the person who could probably do the better job with that would be either Scott or Mike, but in, in, in my world, as we were going through uh, recruiting the initial group of folks, entities, the privacy offices of each of these entities was part of this conversation. The general counsels of each of these entities was part of that conversation. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to write a contract with 25, 35, 45 general counsels all talking about nuances associated with these various places, but it's, it was an exceptionally difficult challenge. So I think that that would be something that Scott would probably take on future tense in order to figure out the appropriate level of transparency around the privacy concerns on the technology, because once we capture the data, it still has significant um, scrutiny and involvement associated with making sure that nothing gets into that data stream. So the technology can be configured in a particular way based on the privacy concerns within the data sharing uh, agreements, but uh, additional transparency would have to come from outside of my organization because I'm internal to the organization. Scott, could I cover no, one please. thing just yeah. before? So um, before we even started working with uh, uh, NERC and the ESI SEC and the industry guys to migrate to the where we are now, um, I've worked with our privacy officer of the Department of Energy, uh, Jeremy Hanley. Um, he's uh, the, the lead across the department. He oversees all of our intelligence activities for the intelligence organization uh, in addition to every other, th other projects. So I've worked with him for the last two years and have gone through uh, three privacy impact assessments. Uh, I had to redo them each time we changed the configuration of the program. So for the original pilot, I had to do a PIA, and we developed and, and signed. And then when we brought in and partnered with NERC and the SISAC, uh, we had to do another one. And then when we had our first operational pilot with Norse and FireEye, we had to do another one, separate one, because that was, again, a different process, a different flow. So each one, we had to do an updated PIA, PIA for each of those. But um, so we've worked very closely with, uh, with uh, our privacy office through the whole process. I'll, real briefly, um, I think Tim hit it on the head, future tense. Uh, we are all getting comfortable with, on the industry side, this framework, uh, the information itself, uh, in working with the attorneys, I learned another little phrase. Uh, uh, general counsel's offices are the business prevention department. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> apologies to the attorneys in the room. Uh, but there were obvious concerns for the companies themselves and their liabilities and exposure. There was concern about their employees uh, and the folks who would have to affirmatively say that they understood that the network they were operating on was being monitored. Uh, the banner language was one of the hardest problems to solve uh, during this, th this whole negotiation. Uh, and so to Tim's point, I would simply say, uh, I think we recognize the benefit of transparency in this space. Uh, but would need to feel really comfortable about what it was we were being transparent with. Uh, and it's something I would have to go to the owners and operators and users and, and make sure they were comfortable with what we were ultimately disclosing. So in terms of what ought to be disclosed, I, I don't think that the public needs to know the name of every participant in the program. I don't think the public needs to see um, classified threat indicators. What I think people need to know is kind of the class of entities that are involved, what the ro relative role of the government is to the other entities that are involved, and information about the information being shared that is 
detailed enough so that technical people can look at it and say, this is what needs to be shared and this might not need to be shared. I, I, and, and, and again, uh, it, these, these things, they're, they're reasonable. It's not that privacy should be an impediment to, to a program that works. It's that uh, a program that works can work uh, together with the privacy concerns uh, resolved. And a couple things to, to what Shane said earlier. Um, when it comes to removing PII in, in um, the legislative debates right now, mm -hmm. I think virtually all the privacy groups accept the notion that reasonable efforts are good enough and that there's a duty to look for it. That's part of being reasonable. But uh, a reasonable effort that is unsuccessful is good enough uh, because you can't guarantee an outcome. At least we, we would say that you can't guarantee an outcome in this space. Uh, and the privacy groups that are actively engaged all recognize that, that PII that includes IP address, for example, is going to be necessary to be shared in order to describe a threat. And we get that. And we, uh, we wouldn't have... Uh, um, we wouldn't have a leg to stand on to say, no, you can't share that which is necessary to describe a threat. So I, I think that, you know, the debate has, has kind of gotten beyond those things and moved on to some other things. Uh, example, um, do you have to look for um, the irrelevant PII in order to scrub it out? Or can you just say, mm -hmm. well, we didn't know, we, 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 uh, we took a look, we weren't sure, so we passed it on. And that, that's really where we are at this point. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I, I do appreciate that uh, a lot of the groups do have that opinion, and I think that's a, that's a very reasonable and strong opinion. Some, some still, some holdouts on terms of the breadth of the PII. I also want to say that, uh, again, education here is absolutely key, and uh, when I've had these debates previously, I've actually sat down and I've pulled out a stack of indicators of compromise and I've put them on a table, and I said, these are chosen at random, find me a piece of personal information. Mm -hmm. It's not there. I mean, we have, nobody has any interest in collecting it in the first place. It's not relevant to this type of intelligence. Uh, I think that the more we include people in that process and have the privacy advocates actually on hand to see that, I think the, the arguments are going to fall away very quickly and this will be accelerated. So I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience uh, up here in the front. Just wait for the microphone. Hi there, James Greathouse from Industry Canada. Um, how does CRISP currently deal with international partners and what are the future in implications for international partners? Go ahead. We've been, uh, we've had several calls and conference calls with uh, Canadian entities in the North American power grid and we all hold it as a goal to uh, bring a partner in is if we can. Um, it obviously raises some difficult things of the, the classified enrichment piece, how would that happen with a Canadian entity? But we've had numerous, at least three or four conference calls with the right Canadian government and private sector representatives, and they're thinking about it and looking at it, and we will continue to pursue it. If, we, if it means that the Canadian intelligence community would have to serve that function, so be it and we could partner with them directly rather than us doing the enrichment for Canadian entities. Let me say real quickly, I'm, I'm excited about CRISP, not just so that CRISP could be expanded, but as a proof of concept. I think this structure, this framework, is, has a whole lot of promise to it, and I think if it works in, in this context, uh, we can start up in, in other places, not necessarily an extension of this program, but other programs that are modeled on it. I think we had a question here. And, and if I could just to, to respond, the Canadians are already participating because they're members of the ESISAC. They actually see the reporting that we generate in the sanitized way in the portal. It's just not identified in the portal as coming from CRISP. It's just things that we post. Hello, I'm Megan from Obsidian Analysis and kind of going on that proof of concept while the utility sectors had a lot of struggles and sorting this out, have they, has their recent success proven to be a motivator for other sectors that are much more behind, such as the oil and gas sector, as they're kind of interlinked? And secondly, um, in addition to 
being a motivation just, you know, for their own security, are there any other motivators out there, say, insurance companies, showing their do due diligence to insurance companies? So I'll take a, I'll talk to both of those just a little bit. Um, I always hesitate to say that any of the sectors are behind. I, I sort of go at all the sectors are different and have different needs and, and, and different goals. That said, uh, I, I think the, the right word is proof of concept. And uh, there are other sectors who, again, I sort of bristle at this notion, but who are ahead, who are doing some unique and interesting things themselves that we are also learning from. So a big component of what the ESCC is doing is looking at this in terms of uh, cross-sector and, and interdependencies as effectively the common interdependency for so many other sectors uh, we are foisted into the middle of it, and to the extent that other sectors can benefit from our experiences, we think that's a good thing. And we are socializing what we have done. Um, and in a lot of cases, not to name names, uh, uh, other sectors are looking at what we've done with um, intrigue. Uh, the second question was? Oh. Insurers and all of that. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, not specifically as it relates to CRISP, but as these different projects that are really linking government and industry uh, get more publicity and help to do the, in some cases, help to provide more information and underwriting tools to the insurance community, to the credit markets, to other places. Uh, we are seeing an interest in uh, them learning from, again, these experiences and the information that's flowing and the security posture. I also think, and this just comes from recent experience in talking to some of the credit rating agencies, there is this increasing recognition that you cannot protect everything from everything. So one of the benchmarks for uh, how mature are you is how capable are you of degrading gracefully and responding quickly. And again, CRISP is one of the things we can point to that facilitates that. I think we have time for one more question over there. Hi, uh, Randy Sabet from Cooley. Um, this has to do with the discussion of trust that was going on. And for those of us who have been in this area of standing up these communities of interest for many years, trust is the biggest issue. And it's difficult to force trust. And in fact, with a lot of groups, they're only successful because of you know, pre-existing trust relationships that might be in place. So the, you know, that's true of the, the FSI SAC to some extent. So the, the question here would be, how much of uh, pre-existing trust existed amongst the CRISP members? And is that something that you see that the, the lack of that trust as a potential barrier for other participants? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, no, um, trust is always a barrier. And actually, this gives me a good, a, a good place to talk about something I neglected to in my original comments. And that's that this is not the only answer. There are communities of interest there are, uh, uh, that are forming around a lot of different tools. Uh, I have companies who are part of various operation centers, virtual, that they're working together, and it's a very, it's based on this trust model. Um, and so my point here is, we don't want to say that CRISP is the only answer for information sharing across the electric utility sector. It is one tool in the toolbox, and its particular benefit is that it socializes the information to the non-users as well through the ISAC. We're particularly proud of that. So that's, that's one part of it. Second is, as trust relates to CRISP, um, I'll just say this. Uh, as we negotiated the original contracts with a core group of companies, trust was developed. What we are doing is taking that core group of, co of companies and using them effectively as proselytizers to help others in the industry understand nothing to fear here. The ISAC is not a regulator. Uh, here is our success. Here is how we view the benefits and help to onboard these new companies. Uh, and, and then hopefully what we get is this critical mass. And as you get, you know, dozens, then maybe you get tens of dozens because everybody else recognizes 
uh, that, uh, uh, well, okay, there's nothing to fear there. The leading edge of folks that have gone forward and they haven't gotten killed. Uh, so we, we can follow now. And uh, the other part of it that we haven't talked about a whole lot is the more companies we have, it socializes the cost and actually reduces the cost for some of the uh, smaller companies who might not be able to afford it otherwise. Uh, and that also helps to deploy uh, in an even broader community. Well, I, I wanted to take this time to just thank our panelists. I, this has been a really great discussion. It's it's um, it's really great to see a lot of e experimentation happening in the sort of cybersecurity information sharing space. We've we've seen a lot of sectors try different things, and at CSIS we actually had a, a project looking at this across sectors. And what we found was that sectors that sort of share um, common goals, trust, similar types of threats and that, like uh, Greg said, are not consumer-facing in some ways, or user-facing, um, that, that deal with a lot of personal communication, tend to have an easier time sharing than, than others. Anyway, I think there's a lot of lessons learned from all of these different programs, and uh, I really want to thank our panelists for, for sharing their experiences today. Thank you. Uh, people from government, and the big question we heard over and over again was, when is Congress actually going to get something done? So let me let me give you uh, the, the good news up front. Um, talking about the process, on March 12th, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, reported out a bill on a 14 to 1 vote on cybersecurity information sharing. Um, that's kind of remarkable. It's hard to get 14 to 1 votes to say today is Wednesday in the U.S. Senate uh, these days. So we, uh, we took that as very positive accomplishment. Two weeks later, the House Intelligence uh, Committee and the House Homeland Security Committees uh, both put out bills that are very similar to ours and, uh, and plan to, to merge the two in, in some way that makes sense on in House procedure. Uh, we are talking about the probably last week in April or thereabouts being the week where this all actually happens when the, uh, the Senate and the House take up legislation with the goal of uh, merging bills together and getting something to the president's desk by around Memorial Day. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to happen. Uh, we still have, as Michael said uh, up front, we have a lot of discussion that needs to go on with the executive branch. As Greg said, uh, there's a lot of interest in continuing to, uh, to, to hear out changes that, that can be made to legislation to make sure that it's got as much support as possible. Uh, let me talk a little bit um, about the substance of, uh, of the legislation. Uh, and let me start by saying that I was very encouraged by a lot of what I heard in this panel because uh, a lot of what is going on in the CRISP program is the kind of thing that we are trying to incentivize in, in federal legislation. Um, one point to note up front, the legislation that we have drafted really needs to apply across the board. Uh, it's voluntary, but we want to make sure that it applies as well to the energy sector, the financial sector, who are both fairly well advanced, but also to a mom and pop shop that has, happens to have been the victim of a cyber attack and wants to share some information or to learn from, from what others have, have, uh, have had to share themselves. So, so while we could legislate, uh, and I'm sure they don't want to because they already have a program that's working, um, we have tried to take a pretty, uh, a pretty broad stroke. The legislation that uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee reported out uh, fundamentally does three things. It authorizes, number one, the sharing of information, and that information is limited to cyber threat information and to defensive measures that companies can take. Uh, a, among companies within the private sector with no government involvement, or B, from the private sector to the federal government. Uh, and there's a whole big chunk of the bill that, that deals with, uh, with saying exactly how that uh, can happen. Secondly, the bill authorizes companies to implement uh, defensive measures on their systems. Uh, and third, it allows, it authorizes, notwithstanding other laws, companies to monitor their own systems for cybersecurity purposes. Um, those latter two things that, that our legislation and the House legislation uh, uh, does is absent from the White House proposal. So I expect that as we go forward, there's going to be a bit of, uh, a bit of discussion there. Uh, our view is uh, we need to remove as many impediments, real or perceived, as possible in order to improve cybersecurity in the private sector and therefore uh, with the federal government as well. Um, so we really, um, 
have approached this uh, in the spirit of removing barriers. And those barriers take the form of legal barriers. There are laws on the books today that prevent the sharing of some information or monitoring of, of, some, uh, uh, of some type for cybersecurity. Uh, barriers in the form of regulation. The previous panel talked quite a bit about the concerns about sharing with a regulator, um, and our bill actually um, basically outlaws the, uh, the regulatory use of information shared for this purpose with a narrow exception. Um, and then removing cultural and, and technological barriers as well. Um, all of this under, again, the premise that the government uh, can't do this, can't protect cybersecurity, and, uh, and, and therefore needs to do a lot more to empower uh, the private sector uh, and also to encourage and incentivize sharing. Uh, a lot of that, obviously, is done through liability protection. Um, uh, let, me, let me talk about that uh, for, for a moment. This is the third bill that um, has gone through or been produced by uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, there's been a lot of legislation in other committees as well. The first, uh, uh, the first real approach uh, culminated in 2012. There was a comprehensive bill in the Senate that was led by Senators Lieberman and Collins, uh, and we had written a, an information sharing piece of that. That bill got to the Senate floor after a few days of debate. It failed to get cloture because we had one Republican vote to, to move the bill forward, and the bill died essentially because it lacked private sector support, a lot of that because of, uh, of what was seen as leak, uh, weak liability protections. Uh, in the next Congress, uh, the, the past two years, the Senate Intelligence Committee put out a bill that addressed that problem, uh, had quite strong private sector support, didn't even make it to the Senate because it lacked uh, support from the privacy side. Uh, so this is our third bill, and I, I think we've hopefully finally learned the lesson, encouraged by a 14-to-1 vote, that uh, you need to work with the private sector, you need to work with privacy groups, you need to work with the other parts of government, and, uh, and if no one's getting everything they want but everyone can live with it, then hopefully we've, we've basically struck the right balance. Um, so there's a lot that's going to need to be done um, from, I mean, to a certain extent, this is the easy part. I mean, it's taken us four or five years, um, but putting in a system that's going to allow for the kind of sharing that we want and, and that is either modeled on or building heavily from CRISP uh, is going to uh, take a lot of work. First, there's the technical part. As our bill is structured, we are envisioning and encouraging real-time sharing of the type that does not quite exist today, and where it almost exists is, is, is very narrowly um, uh, implemented, um, which will require building the pipes and drafting the coding so that data, whether structured or not, coming into the government from any number of places to any number of places, can get where it needs to go broadly uh, among federal agencies in real time. Um, moreover, uh, the way we see it, once that information gets to the government, whether it's the final destination is um, the NCIC at the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Energy or, yes, the FBI or NSA or any number of appropriate federal agencies that, in our mind, actually need to have information because they have a role to play in cybersecurity, those places have to have the wherewithal to be able to uh, ingest uh, analyze and act on that information also in real time or at least at machine speed because God knows if we've got bureaucrats or even well-intentioned analysts uh, on the government side who have to act on and interpret everything that's going on, we are going to be continuing to play defense rather than actually being in, in the position of preventing or at least mitigating some of the attacks uh, we're seeing. Uh, that's the technical side, which is probably easier than the policy side. Uh, and so all of the legislation that's been drafted uh, on Capitol Hill over the past five years has required uh, the promulgation of some set of, of policies, procedures, and privacy protections that govern the uh, receipt, the dissemination, the use, and the retention of, of the cyber threat information that is going to be coming in in potentially very large uh, amounts. So uh, our approach, uh, which is similar to what the House has, uh, has done, is to establish some of those in legislation and defer a lot of that to the executive branch. Uh, we have a 180-day requirement for the Attorney General to put in place procedures. Everyone in the room knows that you know, the executive branch can't 
do much in 180 days, uh, let alone um, set policies of, of this uh, complexity. But some of the things that are going to need to be worked through. How do you make sure the privacy interests are not sacrificed when companies are sharing the information, uh, especially given that the very companies that we are hoping will participate are the same companies that hold vast amounts of third-party data? Um, how do you balance the benefits from having uh, the cyber-related information shared broadly across the government, including with various three-letter acronym agencies, um, because they have roles to play, while also addressing the concerns that the FBI, for example, is going to go use this information to prosecute, or the NSA is going to use it to collect domestic intelligence, which they can't. Um, how do you preserve existing and working trusting, trusted relationships, like CRISP, like the many ISACs that are out there, while trying to create a new portal that goes through the Department of Homeland Security uh, under the, the basis that uh, centralizing and streamlining information sharing is going to ultimately uh, uh, lead to the benefit of all, but understanding that every different information sharing relationship is, uh, is, is uh, sort of driven by the particulars of the company and the agency involved. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that we do have a narrow exception in our bill that regulated entities can share with their regulators outside of DHS and still get the same kind of liability protection that otherwise would require going through DHS. Um, how, do, how, how should we, uh, how should the government uh, simultaneously protect companies for the voluntary sharing of information that we are trying to incentivize without providing protections that would actually prevent um, uh, prosecution or other review of potentially very nefarious or, or problematic uh, sharing when up front it's going to be very difficult to identify uh, what, what's going on. So like I said, some of those are dealt with directly in our bill. A number of them uh, we punt because that's how we get legislation done. Um, but I'm happy to sort of uh, go through any of those um, uh, in, in Q&A. I will say that the bill places a, a premium on flexibility. All the sharing in the bill is voluntary, um, and really the only rules are, one, when sharing, companies are limited to sharing cyber threat indicators and defensive information. We are not interested in PII. We are not interested in them sharing uh, uh, speculation or contextual information in this mode. There are great, great ways to do that, but that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, secondly, that when companies are sharing information, they do take the kind of steps that were discussed earlier to strip out PII that, that's known to be included and, to, and, to, uh, and or to implement practices that are going to uh, have an automated review for that kind of information. So restricting fields, um, whatever it is. We don't want to define what it is because the problem with all of this uh, is what, if we try to legislate too specifically, we will be outdated in, in years, if not months. Uh, so we're trying to put in place parameters that are going to work. Um, let me say one last thing before closing. Uh, we do recognize that, uh, just like with the Department of Energy in the CRISP model, there is a, a, a greatly increased role that the government needs to, pl to, to play here, and it should not be information from the private sector to the government or private sector to private sector. The government uh, has a lot of information at its disposal on uh, both cyber threat indicators that have not been shared and also useful information about what foreign cyber actors are doing that are useful for companies. Um, and so the first thing that our bill, after giving itself a short title and defining some terms, is to push the executive branch into sharing more information out, whether that's unclassified information, declassified information, or classified information that, that needs to be shared consistent to the, uh, the appropriate protections. Um, with that, let me stop. I am happy to take some questions, um, and uh, both, both, both here and, uh, and, and afterwards as, as desired. Uh, we've got one in the uh, back there. I can see it there. Thank you. Tal Copen from Politico Pro Cybersecurity. Uh, I'm curious, what are the odds of the various committees in the House and Senate actually pre-conferencing a bill together uh, before anything hits the floor versus trying to conference something after? Right. Um, so there will not be any sort of official pre-conferencing um, and, and to explain the goal is not going to be to sort of wire this such that the House and Senate go into the process 
with, with the goal of producing the same thing so we can skip this step um, before sending it on to the president's desk. Um, the, the legislation uh, on both sides is quite similar. The, the, the differences uh, are not structural. Uh, they have to do more with exactly how you require or permit uh, uh, or, or shape different things. Uh, so I expect, and, and um, in, in I, I know for the Senate, and I believe for the House, um, there will be a, a fairly open amendment process. So once you, once you get there, any kind of agreement you've got <laughs> will go out the window anyway because the, the, the Senate will, will work its will. Um, I, I think what is most likely to happen is uh, that both chambers will pass a bill, there will be discussions to see whether or not it'll be possible to come to an agreement um, and then send it back and forth outside of formal conference. Uh, but the goal here is to get the best product at a reasonable speed. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, goal of Memorial Day, that may be optimistic. Um, the president has not yet said that he would sign this legislation if it reaches him, uh, which we certainly are, uh, are hoping for. Um, uh, so, so with everything else, flexibility. Maybe I'll cheat and ask a question that uh, you can dodge if you want, but there's some other bills that are coming up uh, in the next couple months, uh, at least for people to think about or talk about. One is the uh, uh, FISA, of course. Um, one is the uh, sections of the Patriot Act, like 215, that are involved perhaps in surveillance activities. Um, do these particular debates have any overlap with what you're trying to do on information sharing? Will they complicate passage? What do you, what do you think about the relationship? Uh, they, they certainly won't complicate passage at all. No, 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 no chance whatsoever. Um, no, that's, that's blatantly it's untrue. It's a relief. Uh, uh, so we, we view these as very different things. I, from, from the Intelligence Committee perspective, we view FISA as a a lawful means for the government to gain access to information that it is basically affirmatively seeking uh, for foreign intelligence purposes. The cybersecurity we see as information that the government ought to be pushing out and that companies may voluntarily share with no compulsion whatsoever. I mean, we have, we have an entire section of our bill that says everything the government is not allowed to do in order to keep this from looking like it is anything other than voluntary conditioning of contracts, regulation, limiting you know, law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all that said, um, the intelligence committees in both houses are taking lead roles in drafting both pieces of legislation, um, and, and so that will raise eyebrows. and the three provisions that expire from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act expire on June 1st, so the timeline is similar. We, we intend and hope to keep these separate. Um, there are people who would like to say that the cybersecurity information sharing uh, legislation on, in both chambers is a surveillance act. I think we've got very good uh, reasons for arguing back that it is not. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is a surveillance act, um, uh, and uh, and I think that we will be able to make uh, make the case to members of, of the Senate who will undoubtedly be concerned uh, about this and this being a backdoor and this being an attack on net neutrality and lots of other things, uh, other boogeymen you can throw out there um, that, that what we are doing is in fact um, uh, limited and should not be confused with that brush. Michael Eisenberg here in my ABA capacity. Uh, just wondering if uh, in the course of the development of uh, the legislation, uh, any uh, assessment was done or any experience developed about uh, the private sector provisions in Section 214 of the Homeland Security Act that provides for protection of information going from industry to government. Was that looked at and what was the reason for uh, reenacting that, that approach? Um. For the protection of information, um, this, this may not be a perfect answer to your question, and if it's not, let me know. Uh, for, so what we're trying to do here is increase the flow um, and 
clearly by the nature of the problem from the Homeland, uh, for over the past 12 years since the Homeland Security Act was, was passed, there is a problem um, and, and there needs to be uh, the creation of additional incentives or protections to, to increase the flow of information. We do uh, mandate that companies take uh, appropriate steps to safeguard the information that is shared with them or that they are sharing, uh, as you would expect. Um, I, I, that has not been a significant point of de debate because everyone recognizes that that needs to happen and companies, you know, uh, agree that part of their part of their business right now is, is the protection of information, whether they generate it or are involved in the sharing of it. Um, we have not, so the, the 2012 bill that I spoke about earlier had a lot more mandatory aspects to it to include protection of information, um, develop, uh, not, not only development, but uh, implementation of standards uh, for protection um, that didn't get there, so the thought has been to disaggregate some of the legislative approaches and the goals that, that we might all share, um, data breach being another one that is not in, in this legislation, um, and try to tackle these more as, as bite-sized chunks rather than, than handling them all uh, in, in a part. Okay, um, Greg, Denise, Mark, I'm gonna call on people. Any of you guys have questions? No? Well, we've, uh, oh, we have one, I'm sorry, one last question, this will be it. I couldn't resist before you said goodbye. Hey, uh, Jason Miller, Federal News Radio. Um, my question deals with the fact that the administration who has been frustrated to say the least over the lack of movement on Capitol Hill over a bill, they continue to executive order what they can. And how does that impact, affect, change what you guys are doing with your bills, all the information sharing executive order, now the one today? Does that change what, how you guys work? Um, well, for, first of all, I'll resist comment, commenting on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, the, 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 by and large, um, uh, the, the executive orders that the administration has put in place are um, important and necessary, but not sufficient um, in, in far as information sharing, as well as the, the, the range of other things they've done on executive order to include the, the sanctions piece introduced today. Um, we would like to have had legislation uh, in, in years past. Um, we would like the executive branch to uh, more strongly uh, support the tenets of the bill that we are working on right now. Um, but there's a limit to what, especially in information sharing, there's a limit to what the president can do uh, by executive order. He cannot provide liability protection and he cannot waive the applicability of other statutes. So. Um, while the information sharing executive order is, is good as far as it goes, um, uh, we, we have been engaged in a number of conversations with uh, all parts of the executive branch, uh, including some who are surreptitiously represented here today, um, uh, in order to try to get final passage of, of something that, that moves the ball e even further. Well, if any of the uh, surreptitious members want to stand up, please. Uh, no, um, uh, thank you for a very frank discussion of legislation. Please join me in thanking David. For that. Okay, well, great event. Thank you very much for attending. Have a good afternoon.